presentation in partnership with the Merriman Financial Education Foundation, because financial fluency is one of the most important tools with which we can help ourselves, our families, our neighbors, and our community. So I'm pleased to welcome tonight, Paul Merriman. Paul is a nationally recognized authority on mutual funds, index investing, asset allocation, and both buy and hold and active management strategies. Now retired from Merriman, the Seattle-based investment advisory firm he founded in 1983, he's dedicated to educating investors, young and old, through weekly articles at marketwatch.com and via free eBooks, podcasts, articles, and, um, and you can find other recommendations and, and more at his website. In 2013, he created the Merriman Financial Education Foundation, dedicated to providing comprehensive financial education to investors with information and tools to make informed decisions in their own best interest and successfully implement their retirement savings program. In his retirement, Paul remains fervently committed to educating and empowering investors. In 2012, he wrote and published the How to Invest series, distilling his decades of expertise into concise investment books and tar to tar targeted to specific audiences. That includes 101 investment decisions guaranteed to change your, your financial future, Get Smart or Get Screwed, and more. He's the author of Financial Fitness Forever, and of course, his latest book, We're Talking Millions, which you'll hear about tonight. He's been called one of the best minds on Wall Street and has been credited alongside Warren Buffett, Charles Schwab, and Peter Lynch, to name just a few. We're grateful to say he's also a board member of the Bainbridge Community Foundation, where he uses his many gifts to help enhance our mission to improve the quality of life in the, in the Bainbridge community. So, Paul, thank you again for joining us. Thank, thank you, Jim. It, it, is a, it is a pleasure. I'm, uh, I'm honored to be here, and I can tell you that I am about as excited as I could be because this presentation tonight is very special to me. I hope it is to the people who've joined us. And by the way, uh, I, I, I found out all the different areas of our country that have uh, joined us for these presentations. And of course, with Zoom, we would, uh, uh, we would expect a, a broad reach, but uh, so many states, I, I don't know why. And, in South Dakota, we, 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 we have a group of people that are evidently following our work. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. And, uh, but thank you all who have come a long way in, in a way to be with us. And also thank you because in the previous weeks, uh, there are some very generous viewers who, who donated money to the Community Foundation. And, uh, and I just think that's terrific. Thank you so much. I have uh, a, a presentation to make here that is in large part, that is if I, there we go, uh, is in large part really meant for a first time investor. Having said that, I do believe that almost any kind uh, of investor will get something out of this presentation but I'm in this business, if we want to call this a, a, a business, I'm in this business to reach as many people as I possibly can with our message. And I really have a belief that I am through you tonight going to extend the reach uh, further than I have before. And maybe by more by a lot more than, uh, th than I'm thinking, but I'm gonna give it a try to make that reach as wide as I possibly can. Understanding that we are dedicated to this idea that knowledge is power. Knowledge is a, a leverage that it is, is difficult to measure the impact of knowledge, but we're focused on financial education for all stages of life right from the day a child is born until the end of our lives, we want to have the strategies and our work is focused mainly on investing. I am not a financial planner trying to help you with insurance or uh, estate planning. We are focused on the investment process itself. And we want you to have the information and the tools that you will be able to make better decisions. My focus 100% is in helping you find a decision that is really in your best interest. I'll talk about that in a minute. 
but it isn't just enough to educate. Somehow, we have to talk long enough or loud enough or well enough that you will make changes toward having a better outcome with your retirement savings. So tonight, when I say it's all about you, I want this view of investing to be about your savings, your family, your financial success, your retirement, your estate. I do not have one interest in the success of Wall Street. That is not where, where I live. I want everything to be done and share with you the things that, that we believe are in your best interest so that all of these things grow for you and your family. We didn't know when I came into this industry the impact of paying a load. For a couple of years, I was a stockbroker and I sold loaded mutual funds. But I can tell you in my early 20s, I honestly didn't understand what that load was going to cost people for the rest of their life. I know it made me a nice profit, okay? I mean, when I say me, the industry, that's what we did. Well, we'll talk here in a few minutes about why things have changed and how for young people today, investing has never been more efficient, has never been potentially more profitable. And I think young people should make a heck of a lot more money than I did and you will see how. I want something in return. I've never asked this before, but I want to lay it out and, and, and let you know what I would love to have our relationship be. I am willing, whether you do anything for us or not, I am willing to work hard to get good information. Chris Patterson and Daryl Balls and myself, we met with a young man yesterday. He introduced us to some research and some work that he had put together, knocked my socks off. And I will be happy, we will all be happy to bring this information to the people who follow our work at zero cost. But where I would like your help is that we would like you to consciously pass this information forward. I, I took a few minutes today and read about pay it forward and the tradition about pay it forward. Well, I'm not expecting you to pay anything except with your time and your your, your thought process to figure out as you hear this information tonight, who in your life, who are the people that, that could be helped by this information? And my hope is this, there will be an archive of this presentation. You will have access to a free copy of We're Talking Millions at the end of the presentation in a PDF format that you can pass. If you knew a thousand people you thought would be helped by this, it would be be my pleasure to know that those people got that information. And I hope that you send an archive of this presentation so they can dig into it with kind of the way that you learned about it tonight. I use this quote from Warren Buffett often because it's the guts of what we talk about. We believe, as Warren says, that to be a successful investor, you only have to do a very few things right as long as you don't do too many things wrong. And John Bogle said the same thing in different words, but the bottom line is, if we can help people identify the right thing to do, that that is the path. But there are going to be people trying to put little roadblocks in front of you there and try to you know, a little detour over here to have a chance to make some quick money. We're hoping that you will find this information in these 12 uh, ideas or decisions or ways that you will see that if you just, or your children or your grandchildren, if they could just do these 12, it would be a life changer. So we will, we will see. What's at the bottom line? And I'm talking, 
bottom line of, in terms of money. I, I teach a high school class. I now talk, I, I call it, we're talking millions today, but I used to call it how to get rich. And the kids liked that idea, how to get rich. But it's basically some of the same information because every one of these decisions is easy to understand. High school kids understand it. It's easy to do. Well, I should say they're simple to do. That would probably be fairer because some of the things I would like you to do are in fact not easy. They have all been time tested. And when I say by the academic community, they are things that study after study show would be in your best interest. It doesn't mean that lottery tickets don't still have winners. There are other ways to get there or that owning an individual stock could lead to huge payoffs. We don't, we don't know that. But in terms of the probabilities of success, these are all time tested. And at the heart of it, the goal for me in helping you is I want to find out, is there any way we can add a tenth of 1%, a quarter of 1%, a half of, a whole percent, 2%. But every time we add a half a percent to your return, and I, I don't mean we do, but that we find a way that that could possibly happen, there is something magic, and it's the magic of compounding. And this table tells the story, and it's factual. What we don't know is what will happen to your money when you invest it. We can't call that a fact, that is unknown. But if we make a couple of really simple assumptions, if we assume that you put away $6,000 a year and you get a return of 8% during the accumulation period, where does that come from? Well, in a while, I'm gonna talk about target date funds. And if you look at how target date funds are built, where you are mostly in equities in the beginning, and then as you get towards retirement, the people who manage these target date funds put more and more fixed income in there, almost like somebody who's managing pension funds to make sure that you're going to have enough to fund your retirement. That's the goal. So we know that that target date fund legitimately has an 8% reasonable expectation call it seven, call it nine, but it's going to be a fairly narrow number. And I'll show you why it's a fairly narrow number uh, in a few minutes. Then you retire. Then you invest in a more conservative way. And we make the assumption here that you will find a 6% compound rate of return, a legitimate return without taking much risk. So Oh, and then when you're retired at age 65, let's say, you're going to take out 4% a year to live on. Those are the assumptions. Here's what that leads to. You make total contributions over that period of time, 40 years, of $240,000. That 8% compound rate of return leads to $1.7 million almost. At the end of your of your life after you have taken out your withdrawals of 2.6 million, you will have a portfolio value of 2.8 million. The real return on your lifetime of investing is the money you take out to live on and the money you leave to others. The rest of that is blue sky because Today, it's a great day to talk about a blue sky. Today is not the day that you're depending on this money to live on. At this point, you're just hoping that what it's worth today isn't 10% less tomorrow. But when you start living on it and taking out the money, that's real stuff. And we want to help prepare you for doing that in a way that is, is very safe and gives you the return you need. But when I think about the money you get and the money you have to leave to others, it tells me that I would add together 
the value of the portfolio at 95 and the total withdrawals. And the two of those in this particular case add up to $5.5 million. Not bad for a $240,000 investment. Now, what about finding a half a percent? What about if you read the book and you find out there's one thing in there where you really believe, yes, I could make it half a percent more, what would that lead to? Again, the assumption that you're working with a target date fund like investment. If you made an extra half percent, it means you get 8.5 instead of eight, you get 6.5 instead of six. You, end, you, spend, you invest the same $240,000, your portfolio value is worth more at 65. It doesn't look like it's going to be a million and a half dollars more, but that's the small difference, relatively small difference between the two 8% and 8.5% growth rate. And instead of taking out 2.6 million, you're going to take out 3.2. Instead of leaving 2.8, you're going to leave 3.7. You have a total amount of almost $7 million dollars over $1.5 million more than what you would have had for a half a percent less. So we can call that a fact because we're making these tight assumptions. They're not, not like the real world. On the other hand, there are steps that I think, we think that you can take to go after that half percent but every one of these 12 ways, in fact, it's, we're talking millions, 12 ways to supercharge your retirement. So we're looking for your kids and your grandkids or you if you're in your 20s or your 30s, we are looking for many ways for you to add a million dollars to the portfolio. It comes, it starts with saving. We know this in many ways is the most difficult thing for a young person. We also know that people who automatically save and have no choice, you must save. We know those people end up with, we'll call it millions. They don't think of it as millions, but they worked hard. They got the paycheck. Automatically money was taken out and put aside for the future, they had no choice, no choice. It's called a pension. And that money then was invested. It wasn't to buy a car, it wasn't to build a house, it was for your retirement. And it worked. Now there's all sorts of reasons why uh, economic and political uh, and uh, reasons why we don't have many pensions anymore. Today, we're in control through a 401k. And the problem is, is that basically what they did for many years was they said, would you like to put any money in a 401k? Well, what's the 401k? Well, they explained the 401k and how they would take some of your paycheck and put it into an account that's your account. And yes, you can get added if you have to, but there'll be a penalty and on and on. And when you're young and you're just getting started and you've lived on so little, the idea of starting to take less if you have a choice, while it may be harmful, uh, it's what people choose or, or chose. But then they stopped doing it that way. What they started doing was automatically you were in the program, you had to opt out so you never saw that money. It was still your money. It went into an account invested for you. And you could opt out and say, I don't want to be part of this. Just give me my money. And people let it go. People accepted it. They learned to live on it. And I can tell you, having talked to lots of young people, a lot of them that say, I couldn't possibly live on less. That simply isn't true in a lot of cases. It's a choice they make. And so the choice of saving versus spending, 
see how easy it would be for that to be a million dollar choice. I mean, that's, that's potentially a $10 million choice, as I'll show you in just a few minutes. And another choice, save sooner. This is something that we need to teach young people. Because when they, when they see it and see how it works, they get it. One of the reasons, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be interviewing Tim Ranzetta. I mean, he is the cream of the crop nationally in educating uh, young people about personal finance. And uh, I, I hope you will join us. Uh, you, you may not have great interest in what's going on inside of our schools or what you might be instrumental in helping go on in a school in your community. But I tell you, you listen to Tim and you will see there is hope because if we can have a chance with these young people, not just to give them a little bit of a math class about, about uh, uh, the, the, the power of compounding over time, no, we want a piece of their educational life so they understand more than just the compounding effect. But here is the compounding effect. Here is a dollar. And I tell young people, one of these days you're going to get married, you're going to have a kid. And here's what you could do. Or if you can't do it, you might suggest to mom and dad they could do it. Or you might suggest to your grandmother and grandfather they could help. A dollar a day from birth to 65. I'm not asking, by the way, that you put away money for 65 years, but I'm saying, remember, all stages of life, I'm thinking about from one to 21, that maybe if you could help out and give some direction and do the right things and set the foundation for them to maintain it, that might be something worth considering. A dollar a day from 65, from birth to 65 at 10% market rates of return. This is not their whole portfolio. This is probably going to be theoretically a small part of their portfolio. But over that 65 years, $365 a year, that turns into $1.8 million. If you wait until year 10, it, moved, it, 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 it grows to 686000 If you wait till they're 21 to start the process, it'll be worth $238,000. And oh, by the way, we're going to talk about making 12% instead of 10. You might choose to go the 12% route instead of 10. And that, uh, that amount is not 1.8 million. It's almost $5 million from that investment of $365 a year. That is all about saving early. Let me give you a more common thing for kids who are in their 20s. Jim and Nadine, wonderful clients of mine when I was in the business. I am out of the business. I no longer give investment advice. In fact, when you start asking me questions, if you do tonight, let me just warn you, I cannot give specific recommendations. I can talk in generalities. I'll do that, I'll do that all day, but I can't give specific recommendations because I don't know enough about you as an individual uh, to do that. But I can certainly try to give general nudges in the right direction if I can. But Jim and Nadine were early clients and I, I just, because I, I love them dearly, I've used them as our person one and person two. They're both gonna put away $5,000 a year. The only difference is Nadine starts five years earlier, 25 to 29, she puts away $5,000 a year. And then Jim joins her putting away 5,000 until they're 65. Sorry, folks. Not theoretically, but in real time. And what would have happened if Nadine had put that money in the market? Because when you're 25 years old, you should have all your money in equities. We'll talk about that later. That separate $25,000 would have grown to $850,000. 
And once you put it to work in retirement and, 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 and take out 4% a year to live on and just let it go, let it grow, you would actually have taken out an income and left to others $7 million. Well, you can say, prove it. Well, I won't be around to prove it, but I can say this. Let's say it'll be somewhere between 3 million and 10 million, but it's the five years of money that Jim didn't have. And that I know from having worked with lots of clients is a game changer. Oops, excuse me. Another decision, another choice, another way. The decision about stocks versus bonds. This is absolutely gigantic. And the reason I can say it's gigantic is because stocks, where you own part of the company, have a history of making 10% on average. In other words, if you bought the S&P 500 and you own the 500 kind of largest US corporations that are public from 1926 or 28, you have about a 10% compound rate of return. If you put it into the total market index, which is a place a lot of people put money, but it's very similar to the S&P 500 and how the returns are figured, it too compounded at the same, a little less than the S&P 500, but, but very close to being the same. So to know that you can own stocks and participate in the growth of great companies and bad ones too, by the way, we'll talk in a minute about that, how that 10% was achieved. You'll be surprised, I can almost promise. But that is compared to the decision to put your money in bonds. Now, very few young people even think that saving for retirement is important to their success. And, and this was in recent surveys. Something like 23% of millennials believed that this process of saving for retirement is a part of your success. Only some 25% of millennials believe they should have money in the stock market because it's a gamble, because it's speculation. It's like going to Vegas. You can lose all your money, they'll say, which isn't true. Well, it is true because some people had all their 401k in Washington Mutual. Yes, it is true. You can go broke. But I'm not talking one company. We'll get to that. But bonds, the safe place to be. And in fact, you can't get a very high return for bonds. If you can get 3% now or 2%, that's pretty good. But going back to 1928, bonds have paid about a 5% compound rate of return. And so immediately when I see five and I see 10, and I think half of 1%, wait a minute, there are 10 half of 1% in the 5% difference between those two numbers. And the fact is that half of I'm sorry, those 10 halves of 1% lead to well over a $10 million advantage. I mean, literally, literally, if you put all your money in bonds for 40 years, you'd have at 5%, you'd have less than $800,000. And then you live off of it and you don't have much to live off of. You put it in stocks and you've got about 2.6 million instead of, 700, 800, less than 800. But then you start living on the 2.6 million versus the 800 on 4%. In fact, if you got the 2.6 million, maybe you can take 5% instead of the 4%. So it's even more. But then if it keeps growing for you, then that distance between that bond investment and that stock investment becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the time you look at the difference over your life, it is likely to be over a $10 million difference. One decision alone. I 
another decision. It too is huge. In a sense, it's an all or nothing, possibly. And I mentioned that just a minute ago. You choose between investing in the stock market in one company, hoping that it is uh, Amazon. How about Amazon? How about Microsoft? How about lots of other companies in the Pacific Northwest or wherever you might live? And yes, you'll probably do okay. You, you probably won't go broke, but every once in a while, one of those companies don't make it. What is interesting to note from the academic community, because with one company, we all know you can lose it all, lose the whole thing. Oh, by the way, you don't lose it until the year before you retire. How do you like that? Huh? But one company's expected rate of return, not by the shareholder, because the shareholders of good and bad companies have pictures of all sorts of good things happening and making lots of money. I know a young fellow who invested in GameStop, not because of what happened, but because he thought it was a good company and it was a cheap, it was a penny stock, basically. And he got into it and then all of a sudden, it, it, it's, it's worth a lot. It was worth a lot. It had nothing to do with the reason he bought it. Some people call that luck. And it turns out that luck has a much bigger impact on our lifetime than we realize. That's in the book. It's not in tonight's presentation, but I will say this. The expected rate of return of a thousand companies is actually the same expected return as one company in the same type of company, the same asset class. We wouldn't expect a small company to have the same expected rate of return as a large one. And here's some ap an academic paper. The, the title of it is, Do Stocks Outperform T-Bills? And uh, if you put that in the search engine, you will get Dr. Besson Binder's uh, study. The study shows that from 19, I think 26, that the return that was achieved by stocks, the market return of 10% that is so well known, that it was actually 4%, one out of 25 companies that produced most of that return because the other 96% on average made 3%, the same return as you would have gotten in treasury bills over that period of time with no risk. So what the academics will tell you is that if you can reach your needs you're in the equity part of your portfolio with a 10% return, and it's rare that that doesn't meet people's needs, doesn't meet their desires, I understand that, but their needs. And that in order to kind of be guaranteed of that, although it's not guaranteed, you buy all the companies. And so what the academics teach us is the highest probability of long-term success as an investor is to own all of them, or to have a portfolio that is massively diversified. When I first came into the industry in the mid 1960s, what we were taught is that if you want to get a good return, you have to own maybe 10 or 20. But that after you get beyond 10 or 20, you lose the ability to achieve the higher rate of return because you're watering down your portfolio. Well, that old myth is still practiced and preached by people who find that picking stocks is a, a sexier way to get people to invest and maybe more profitable in terms of income for the broker, I, I can't say. But I do know that very few companies made a difference. And it's interesting to see some of the giants 
One of the giants is General Motors. Well, who wants to own that dog? Well, as a matter of fact, we used to say that as goes General Motors, so goes the country. That was a that was a, a, an old saw that people would say, if General Motors is going up, by golly, the stock market's probably going to go up too. But in the end, the because the longer you a security exists, the higher the probability of, of default. It's a strange thing. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have a lot of companies that, that fail early on. But you look at, and I'm not saying that GE is going to, GE, General Electric is going to default, but I can tell you that their return, once considered to be one of the best returns in the business, is now very mediocre. So if you're going to end up with mediocre, why don't you just take all of the good ones, put up with the bad ones, they're going to be in there too, because it makes sure that you get the ones that make the difference. Another huge, huge decision. And the beauty of this one, the beauty is that you can invest in this kind of mutual fund. Oh, I didn't mention to first timers. The way you buy a thousand companies or 10,000 companies or in my own portfolio about 15,000 companies, the way you do that is you invest in a diversified mutual fund where professionals manage those funds. You see, that's how you go into the stock market in a savvy way, at least according to the people who aren't trying to sell you something. The academics will say that the index fund for, in fact, even Warren Buffett said, 99.9% .9 of people, both amateurs and professionals should just put their money in the S&P 500. That's an index of those 500 companies. Now there are other people who actively manage and those managers, those managers, what they're trying to do is to beat the market. That's what they wanna do. They want to do better than the indexes. Uh, oh, that's right, they have to charge a lot for that. So that means not only do they have to do better than the, than the indexes, is they have to do it by their management fee as well. Oh, now wait a minute. There's one other thing I forgot. There's also administrative costs inside of that mutual fund. And those, those are more expenses. The, 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 that part of the, alone can cost you a quarter of 1% or a half of 1% in some cases. So the index fund, is, is charging you less than one-tenth of 1% 1 in many cases. Whereas the average mutual fund in a recent, and I'm talking actively managed, in a recent study, all in, it's about 3% a year. And that is before you hire an advisor to tell you which mutual funds to be in. So actively managed funds, when I say they're for suckers, doesn't mean that they're not gonna do fine, that they won't be around average returns. But I can tell you this, the Standard & Poor's organization puts out every six months, the SPIVA report, S-P-I-V-A, they look at the returns of virtually all of the mutual funds for the last 15 years. And they'll look back over that 15 years. Well, they look at a year and three and five and 10, but the period I'm interested in is 15 because we're talking the way we're talking about investing about the long term here. We're not talking about a year or three or five. But at the end of 15 years, only about one out of 10 mutual funds that are actively managed are able to do better than the index, just owning all the companies. But it gets worse. 
that number is based on the mutual funds that are still in existence. So you, you flip to another page of the study, and what it teaches you is that about half of the mutual funds that were in existence 15 years ago are no longer in business. So the ones that are left, uh, those are not just the cream of the crop, but it means the returns that the index is competing against doesn't include the dogs that got kicked out of the pack. Index funds, you know what you get. You pay almost nothing for them. In fact, there are now index funds at Fidelity where you don't pay any management fee. But at Vanguard, the S&P 500, four one hundredths of 1%. Remember, we're talking about one, two, three percent in the case of many of those actively managed funds versus less than one-tenth of one percent. Guess whose pocket that difference is aimed at? I mean, in theory, it's part of what I'm after for you. There are like, it's like half a percent gimmies just sitting on the floor and you just got to bend over and pick them up. But before you pick it up, I can promise you, if you've got much money, there are people who will crawl across crushed glass to get to you and say, no, 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 let me show you something better. Well, let me show you something better. Let's look at those one out of 10 funds that outperform the indexes, because it's making sense to me at first blush that maybe those are the funds I should invest in except for one thing. The academic studies that look back decades and decades and decades find that the people who are able to be in that upper performance level, they're not the same ones the next 15 years. There might be a couple of them that will be. That would happen legitimately just as a random event. Okay? So, index funds. It's a huge decision for you. And hopefully when you're in a 401k, the trustees haven't selected the funds that they have in their 401k because of the guy, they person they golf with. Okay. This happens. Relatively big companies have 401ks that are made up of active managed funds with no index funds at all. And, and, and the reason that happens is because, well, the trustees are maybe buddies with the broker. Now, I'm not making brokers out to be evil here. You know, the four dealers are not obligated to point people down to Honda, okay? This is the way the real world acts. What I'm saying is knowledge is power, and you're going to convert this knowledge into the power of making better decisions. That is what it is about. And the last item on this slide, well, I didn't mention tax efficiency. Oh yeah, there's that too. If this is in a taxable account, index funds are way more profitable, at least a half a percent, at another half a percent in taxes. I hope, I hope towards the end of your life, you'll do donate a little money to your local community, community uh, um, a, a trust. Excuse me. I was thinking about leaving money to the Bainbridge Community Foundation as I said that. Um, here's what I like. Look at this one. Index funds are dependable. And let me tell you why that is, is a little different than just ending up in the top 10%. You know what you're getting now will be the same as you're getting in five years, will be the same as you're getting in 10 or 20 years. Oh, wait a minute, it won't be all the same companies in all the same proportions because it will be adjusting to the ones that are doing better than others because those ones that do better than others become a larger part of the portfolio. And then if they fail, they become a smaller part of the portfolio. It automatically adjusts as opposed to an active manager. They can have a bad year, by the way. 
They can be going through a divorce. I can't tell you what the reason they're ha- Maybe it's just a matter of luck. Bill Miller was the number one manager for 15 years. He beat the S&P 500 every year for 15 years. And then when I say his luck ran out, it just looks that way. Maybe he was really smart to get there, but he had really bad luck after that. But luck entered the picture. And all of a sudden, for a decade, he was at the bottom of the stack. Taxes. Oh, do I envy you young people. I can't tell you what a break you have. I mean, it's a life-changing break. It's, it's, it is the, the slam dunk of slam dunks in terms of you walking away with more money for you to live on, more money for your heirs, your children, charities, whatever you care about. Because when you invest, you have choices. And I know you're going to be thoughtful And make sure you make the right choice because you can put money in IRAs or 401ks that are, yes, they are tax deductible, absolutely tax deductible. And you'll get a refund because you invested in that IRA, individual retirement account. And that's great because they're giving you a benefit. But more than likely, I can't say always, but more than likely what's going to happen to that refund is let's do something. Let's reward ourselves, pat ourselves on the back for having been good savers. And let's go spend that refund in the Roth IRA, in the Roth 401k plan. You did not have Roths available until 1997. I started investing in 1963. I didn't have that benefit from 1963 to 1997. You do. That money compounds tax-free. That money is withdrawn at retirement tax-free. When you reach what they call the age of minimum required distributions, where you have to start unloading everything you put into the regular IRA or the regular 401k, oh no, you don't have to do that with the Roth IRA. You don't have to make those minimum required distributions. You can take out as much as you wish. And when you leave it to your kids, it's tax-free for a while. It is one of the great, the great estate planning tools available to us. But there's one problem. They don't allow you to deduct it for the contribution you made today. You do not get that refund. You cannot go out and have a party. It means the parties you take later are going to be much bigger The trips you take later with that money are going to be way, way bigger. All you have to do, let's say you would have gotten a $1,000 refund, just whatever that took to get that, just put that $1,000 into a calculator and see what that $1,000 is worth in 40 years at 10%, at 8%, at 6%. I didn't have that. You do. And it's a game changer. What you have today, I've just talked about that I didn't have. I didn't have index funds. I'm 77. I uh, didn't have 401ks. I didn't have Roth 401ks or Roths until way into my adult life. And by the way, when I started in the investment business back in the mid-60s, the marginal tax rate for people who made enough money to be in the marginal tax rate was 70%. And just a couple of years before I entered, it was 90%. Now, I'm not talking politics here. I'm just saying that the people that I knew were making a lot of money, even though the government took a lot of it, it looked to me like they're working their tails off. 
evidently because they liked working for the government. Maybe that's what it was. But today, we pay little compared to what we pay them. You're taking advantage of that. But when you're in that Roth IRA, odds are, you know, things come and go. Odds are taxes could be much higher than they are today. And I don't know that you'll be bragging to your neighbors, but you'll be very happy that all the money you're taking out is tax-free. It's pretty amazing. Target date funds. This is, as far as I'm concerned, this is the ultimate investment for most people. If you have children or grandchildren, friends at the office that don't know what to do, uh, this is what to do if you don't know what to do. Because the target date fund, I didn't have this either, started in um, 1993 or four, Vanguard started theirs in 2003. If you tell them when you're 18 years old and you start to work that you want to retire in 2065, then you just put it in the 2065 target date fund and they have your back. Now, when I say they have your back, they're doing the right thing according to what they know about the investment business would be in your best, pardon, interest. In your best interest as an average investor, not as a savvy investor, you'll see that in just a second, but as an average investor, not only do they do everything they want that, that you need to do with that money, the right thing, how much stocks to be in when you're young, how much stocks to be in when you're old and in between. You can even go to a part of, on, their, on their website, they'll show you their glide path, all equity or mostly equities. And then as you get older, you'll see less and less in equities. At, at, at 77, the Vanguard fund would have me in 30% equity, 70% fixed income. Well, I don't mean that I'm smarter than Vanguard, but I'm willing to take the risk of 50-50. And if you become a savvy investor and get an education, you too will be able to make a good decision. But there are all sorts of people along the way who are gonna say, one, I got a better glide path. And two, I think you'll make more money. And I wanna show you how to make more money. I should say weeb because what I'm going to just tell you, tell you about here in just a minute was developed by the Chris Pedersen, who is our uh, director of research for our foundation called Two Funds for Life. But before I leave this target date fund idea, uh, I, I, oh, by the way, I, I shouldn't forget to mention this. You can buy the target date funds with index funds in them with low expenses in them, with all with low turnover to keep your costs of management down, everything in your best interest. They got a couple holes. I'm going to show you the holes. and You can choose to plug them or not. But a Wharton study showed that when they looked at 1.2 million investors, the ones that had purely target date funds and nothing else were built to make 2.3% a year more than the ones that did not have any target date funds in them. And that is typically because they don't have enough equities okay. and they're afraid. I want you to pick up that 2.3%. What's wrong with target date funds? Some of them have bonds in them. I don't want bonds in them when you're 21 years old. I don't want bonds in them when you're 30 years old. I'm okay with bonds in your portfolio when you're 40. But I don't want them in the early years because for every 10% you have in bonds, you reduce your return one half of 1%. 
and they don't have enough of what we call small companies, and they don't have enough of what we call value companies, and they're built to be super conservative. And I'm not opposed to super conservative. But I can tell you this, that the, when I say the engineers, the, a lot of the people that we service are come out of the STEM uh, in the science, technology, engineering, and all of that. And they look at all the tables. And I'm not going to show you all the tables, but you can go to our website and see all the tables. But you will see in table after table, why would somebody put a little bit of something in a portfolio? What would it do to change the financial future? And so I'm going to keep it just so dirt simple. I'm just, oh, before I do, <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, I'm going to take you actually, because I want you, because I'm talking too much. I can see it already. I want you to see the return of stocks, the stock market. But I want to break it down into little pieces. I want one piece to represent from 1928 to 2020, I want one piece to be the very large companies, the S&P 500. I've talked a lot about them. You would know if you looked at the top 50, you'd know almost all of them. And I want to know, what was the average 40-year compound rate of return? Because that's what we're talking about. If you're if you're 20 or 30 or 40, you're talking about invest. In fact, if you're 50, you're probably talking about investing for 40 years. Here's what we know. We know the average compound rate of return was 11 percent. We know the best was 12.5, and we know the worst was 8.9. So you're going to fall somewhere in there. Remember I talked about over a long period of time, what you would expect out of the target date fund is a, a narrow range. We talked about an 8%, but it could be more, it could be less, but it won't be a very narrow range because this is all equities here. But when you're in a target date fund, you've got bonds in there at some point along the way. That's going to narrow that outcome. But I want to go over here for just a second and look at US SCV, that's for small cap value companies. If you like what you hear here, when you read the book and you're going to get the book, you're going to read about small cap value. I'm not going to take the time to do it now, but I want you to see a couple of things. 16.2 is the average 40 year compound rate of return. And the range is from 19 to 11.6. And I believe if you could get 12, that would be great. I don't have, well, there, there's luck. There's luck. Let me talk about luck for just one sec. From 1975 to 1999, that was a long time, 25 years. Well, we don't have 25, we've got 40. But look at here, the compound rate of return, the average is, is, is 11. And yet it, for 25 years, made 17.2%. That is luck to be there during that. So I like having some small cap value in your portfolio. So let's get some in the portfolio. With two funds for life. I'm going to spend a second on this. You're going to read lots more about it. The last half of the book is about two funds for life. I'd like you to consider putting 10% in small cap value or 20, but just 10% and 90% target date fund. Do that. That's it. For 40 years, that's it. The target date fund is doing all its stuff, correcting for this and that. The small cap value is single focused. Just want that little bit of exposure to small cap value. Now, that little bit of exposure can turn into a lot of money. So when you're older, you may want to reconsider, do I want this much money in small cap value? I hope you have that problem. But the second way to do it is using 1.5 times your age. This is more aggressive when you're young. 
it's more conservative when you're old. You take your age, 20, multiply it by 1.5, 30. 30% 30 goes in the target date fund, 70% goes into small cap value. You are young, you can afford to take that risk. You go to the tables, you look at the numbers. Then, as you age, you keep multiplying times 1.5. Let's just jump to 30. So now it's 45% in target date fund, 55% in small cap value. Jump to 50. It's 75% in, in target date fund. It's 25% in small cap value. 66, you're out of the small cap value business. I'm not going to focus on all of this information, but some of you like learning from the past. And I wanna, I wanna honor that intellect, intellectual focus because it's the past that's all we have to study. But I wanna study it at such depth, not that it lets me know what the future is going to look like. I can't know that but it can tell me to expect a certain ride because if I find that nothing is dependable all the time, it won't surprise me when I find out in real life, nothing is dependable all the time. So I look at 1928 here. Let's just look, 1928. That year, the S&P 500 was up 43.6%, fantastic. Small cap blend was up 42.9. Small cap value was up 32.4. Large cap value was up 24.6. Not good particularly for small, not good for value. Historically, value does better than, than the blend, the S&P 500, but not that year. And you, every time you see green at the top of that of those columns, that means the S&P 500 was the best then. Let's look here recently. S&P, 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 small cap value, S&P, S&P. People think the premium for small cap value is gone. It's never to return. No, that is not the way it works. Because there were other, well, let's look here. Let's look at 1975 to 1979. Small cap value is the worst, the worst, the worst, the worst, the worst. This page gives you perspective. I love being able to get perspective, but as something else I want you to see perspective wise here, I want you to notice four funds, 25% each, 25% each, and I want to take it to a, a, a chart that's easier to use. Here it is 20 years at a time. Notice in every 20 year period, four fund combo is right there in the middle. You got safety, are you cautious? Are you oriented to being less aggressive? Four fund combo in equities, terrific, it's terrific. You could use that along with the target date fund. But notice from 1930 to 2019, small cap value 13.7, small cap blend, a little better quality, 12.2. There's the four funds at 11.9, large cap value at 11.1, S&P 500 9.8. Why is the S&P 500 the worst performer? If you can figure that out, you do understand investing. And if you haven't figured it out, it's because it's the highest quality investment, but not quite. The highest quality investment was one month T-bills. You were guaranteed by the US government that you were going to get your money back in 30 days. Didn't get very much for it. You notice the compound rate of return was 3.3. And then you take a little more risk when you go out 20 years. It's 5.7. Take a little more risk, it's 9.8. You see how investing is supposed to work? Having said that, the minute you get into something and it doesn't work for you in the short term, 
a lot of people throw their cards on the table and say, I fold. And that is uh, uh, when you fold, you're leaving money on the table for the rest of your life, unfortunately. Okay. Point I want to make here. See all these times when it, this arrow was basically flat across, you were there and then you ended up in about the same place over there. That's because the return of small cap value and the S&P 500 relatively were the same. And then all of a sudden, you'll see this bounce, big bounce over three and a half years up 136%. That's because small cap value took off like a rocket. And then it was sideways in high, let's call it it hibernated for what, 19 and a half years. And that, by the way, it didn't do badly. It just didn't make big extra returns. And then in three years, up 92%. Then it was 192% over a seven year period. And then 140 over a five. And here we are. This is the end of 19. Over the last year, the S&P 500 is up, I think, um, 49 or something. Maybe it's more than that. Small cap value up 113. So just want you to be prepared. This is not, when I said it's, it's easy, I said it's simple. That's what I really meant to say with the market because it's, it is going to try to make you uncomfortable. And my goal is to make you comfortable. Sources of information. You got a question, like if tonight you wanted to ask me this question. Uh, what's the difference between an ETF and a mutual fund? Don't go to my website. Go to The Balance. Uh, go to investor.gov. The, these are great sources for information on the basics. It's not that we don't know the basics. We do, but we can only do so much. So my answer, the answer you get from me, has got to be done in you know, 50 words or less. You want more than 50 words. So if there's one site, a commercial site, that I think tells the best truth about these things we need to understand, thebalance.com is great. You want to know mutual funds? Morningstar.com. They have all the information. In fact, we'll be doing a, a special podcast uh, uh, and, and a video on how to use Morningstar in the coming months. But uh, they are the source of almost all of the important information on performance. Kiplinger is great for lists of 10. 10 mistakes you're going to make if you're blonde. I don't know. I mean, they got so many lists for for, for a five or 10 mistakes you'll make as a, as a retired person, mistakes you'll make as a first timer. Boy, if you're a first timer, I don't think it's bad that you read those mistakes that first timers make. I'm trying to keep you from making them in my way. NGPF is about the fellow Rick, uh, Tim Ranzetta, who I'll interview uh, in a couple of weeks. This is his site. Uh, he, all of the work he does in teaching teachers so they can teach students in the best way he knows how. He, it's completely volunteer on his part. He does not get paid a dime for all that he does. And it's an amazing story. But I want you to take a look and choose, do I want to hear from him? Those of you who are really first time investors, one of the smartest people in our industry is William Bernstein. Uh, uh, you can get a free PDF of his uh, of his book, or you can purchase it at Amazon. Uh, if you want to get another amazing book, if you want to understand the emotion of investing, you can get a free PDF or you can go to Amazon. I don't know, maybe it's 12 bucks for the paperback. Jason Zweig, Your Money and Your Brain. If you control your brain, you control your future investing. Your brain is that constant attack by your emotions. When it comes to sex, food, and money, they are not intellectual decisions. What we need to do is to figure out a way to overcome the emotion when it keeps telling you, hey, let me, let me have the wheel. I can handle this. No, 
the, the emotions can't handle this. So I hope you'll read his book. And then my book, and here you, you click for a free PDF copy. By the way, you'll end up on our mailing list. And if you really don't want to get all of our great stuff, we've got 700 articles and 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 podcasts and videos and and uh, new stuff coming all the time, trying to help you be better. Uh, or you could buy it at Amazon. I, I would I would encourage you to read the reviews of the book. Uh, we have two fours, and the rest are fives, the reviews, and a lot of them are from students, high school and college students. All the profits from this, from, uh, from that, if you buy the book uh, at, uh, uh, at Amazon, go to our Financial Education Foundation. I also volunteer all of my time to do this for folks. Uh, now, remember what I asked you to do. You're gonna sign up, you're gonna get the free PDF. Then I'm asking you when this archive, this piece is archived to send the archive piece. Now, maybe I've made it too difficult. Maybe it's not as basic as you would like for the person you're sending it to. And I would understand that. Then just send them the book. And I, my hope is it will be helpful to them. And that you'll feel good having done that. Thank you, Paul. Jim, I know, I, I, I know it's time that we have to, to uh, take a few questions. Jim has a hard finish tonight. And, and here's what I want to promise. Uh, I want to promise that uh, if you email me your question, by the way, remember, it can't be personal stuff. It has to be kind of general. Uh, and don't ask me the difference between an ETF and a mutual fund. But Paul at paulmerriman.com. I was coming to that slide here, Jim. I don't know why I'm having trouble getting to that slide, uh, but, but I'll put that in the chat, Paul. Okay. Uh, here, here we go. We're getting there. We're getting there. Okay. Um, here's our website, and there's my email address, and you can sign up for Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter, uh, and know that everything that we do is in your best interest. And I really, I challenge you. You ever see an example of where you don't think it's in their, your best or the, the average client's investor's best uh, uh, case in, in their favor, you email me. I wanna know that because I don't want that on our site. And thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Okay. Questions. So, what do you got? A couple of questions. Uh, there's, there are a few questions. We may not be able to get to all of them, but one question, um, when you're setting up a fund for a, a young person, um, there's, there probably are a couple different actual vehicles that you can use in order to, to set that up. The, um, can you talk briefly about that? And I, I think that you said that your recommendation is to put 50% in a target date fund, 50% in small cap value. Is that uh, well, you right. know something, if, if you're talking about, I guess it depends how old the child is. I'm assuming it's a minor from the question. Is that true? Does yes. it seem like they're, uh, I, if, if it is used for the, for underwriting an IRA, then that's the whole idea of this account. Then I do think that, that you should put it in small cap value. We, we write all sorts of articles. If you don't want to do small cap value, you 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 do it. Uh, maybe the four fund strategy. Uh, so you have a little bit of four, but it should be all equity because we're starting them out at at let's say at birth. We don't want bonds in that portfolio, just like we don't want bonds at age twenty one. But here's the thing: you might think about. You can't set up an IRA for a child. Uh, when they're a newborn, unless you can get them on the front page or in, in a catalog. And I've, and I've done that in my life, uh, uh, created an IRA for a child who was on the front page uh, of, a, of a mail order catalog. Uh, but normally you're going to put that money aside. I would put it aside knowing it's for your child in your name. That's what I do. I put it in your name so that when they turn 18, it's not theirs. And then what you do is at that point when they're adult enough, you're putting that money to work in their IRA, their Roth IRA. And, and if you're really weak need about it and worried about the child doing something that you don't want, you can have, the, it can be in the child's name, the child's social security number, and you can have the confirmations come to your home. I mean, there's a bunch of things that you can do that would be reasonable to protect the child against hurting themselves. 
and the child could be the beneficiary of that in the event of your passing. Well, that would be a, that would be an estate thing. I mean, that yeah. sure, sure. And this is not for five twenty nine. If you were talking for five twenty nine, mm -hmm. I'd be thinking more like a target date fund for a uh, for somebody who's saving for retirement, which would be a lot more conservative. Yeah, and they have those, by the way. Vanguard has a target date fund uh, that you could buy to, for uh, uh, for somebody going to college in a five twenty nine. Great. Um, a question about the the four fund combo. So for those in their early fifties, you know, without the forty year uh, span for that, do you still recommend the four four fund combo in the retirement plan? You know, I do. Now, now there's one of those situations where I'd want to know how much they have uh, in equities because they have some uh, comfort in equities. Here's what I'd I'd tell them. I would tell them go to paulmerriman.com. Go to best advice. There's a drop down. You're going to see an article entitled Ultimate Buy and Hold Strategy. Then you're going to be another one about alternative investments. But then you're going to come to the fine tuning tables. And what you will see is a fine tuning table for the SP 500, for the four fund combo, for a 10 fund combo, for a two fund combo. And they show the return of these strategies one year at a time from 1970 through 2020. You can see the worst of times. You can see the best of times. You can get a sense. You can compare it to the S&P 500. We show the S&P 500 on the same page so that you can determine how different is this. Guess what? You will note there really is almost no difference in terms of losing money with the S&P versus the four fund combo. So would I recommend it for a 50 year old? I'm a 77 year old who has that. So yes, I'm okay, except not all 50 year olds. Great. All right, so you, um, in your book, you recommend annuities despite being somewhat of a bad word among financial advisors. At what age do you recommend looking into annuities if someone feels this is a good piece of advice? Well, let me explain why I like annuities. I love annuities. I do not. I have never sold an annuity. And in fact, if you want to learn about annuities, the person that I trust, you can go to his website. It's StanTheAnnuityMan.com. Let me tell you how Stan works. He's got 400 videos. He's got books that are free. And if you sign up for any of this, he will not call you. He's got a button he pushes. That sets up and you ask for a chance to talk with him. This might be just to ask a question, or it might be because you want to consider annuities. He talks to 12 people a day. Nobody else talks to his clients, but Stan. He knows the business inside out. Let me tell you where annuities work. A lot of people have undersaved. One of the reasons they've undersaved is they've been too conservative. And they are not, if they start letting somebody talk them into going into the stock market at 65 or 70 or something, and they make it sound less risky than it really is, they could end up losing money at the very moment that they can't afford to lose any money but they can't afford to live off the CDs. The beauty of an annuity, and I'm only talking about one kind of annuity, it's a single premium in the immediate annuity. It is the same thing as a pension. It's the same thing as when you retired, you took your pension fund, and instead of taking it from the company, because you have that choice, you move it into somebody else's pension fund. It's called an immediate life annuity. And the reason I love it, I just, I just talked to old friends in their 80s, and they don't have any kids to worry about, but they don't have enough money. The only way they can take get a seven to eight percent payout every year for the rest of their life, guaranteed, guaranteed, is to own an annuity. But you got to buy it right. You got to buy it at the at the lowest possible cost, but it still has to be a high quality. And when you understand how 
the insurance industry prices these annuities, you would understand why on one day, New York life can be the worst of 10, and another day, they're the best of 10. But Stan will show you the returns of 10 different annuity single, and, and he searches through dozens and dozens of companies. And all you have to do is say, thank you, Stan, been nice knowing you. And you call up your local insurance person and say, all right, I'll do business with you. you I know you've been waiting for years. I'm going to do it. Here is the company I want to do it with. Here is what I expect to be able to get as monthly income. Because in some cases, those insurance companies have more than one payout. If you don't get the right, the right deal, I mean, it's, it's a wicked industry. Doesn't mean everybody's evil, but I'm back to the Ford versus the Honda. You know, what are they responsible to tell you? That's great, Paul. Um, so with the time left, maybe would you talk again, how do people access the um, the downloads of the books that you mentioned? That the, the, oh, they're look you, 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 right inside of that of the PowerPoint, you can just click on there. Okay. So we'll have that PowerPoint up on our website. On the web. Okay. Okay. And, and you'll and, get the book. Yeah, I sent that link. And so we'll make sure that we'll make sure and, that we clarify that. Uh, and you can you. email me if you really get lost in this process. You know, I'm just an old guy trying to fill a day. Okay. So I am happy to take the time. If, if something that uh, was covered is, uh, uh, is not as clear as you'd like. That's fantastic. Okay, well, Paul, thank you again for uh, taking the time to uh, to share this with us. Anyone else who has questions, please don't hesitate to. Um, I've got one to more Paul. thing to say, by the way, okay. Jim. I'm interviewing Larry Swedrow next week. That's the that's the event. Larry Swedrow knows so much more than I do about this process. He is the smartest guy I know in the industry, and I think we are blessed to have him come spend an hour and a half. He is absolutely phenomenal. And boy, I can't wait to ask him the questions that I know you want to know. But if you want to write to me and tell me the questions you would like me to ask Larry Swedrow, you just let me know that you've got the address, paul at paulmerriman.com. Okay? See you next week. Hey, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Debbie, Welcome. and all the folks at the Community Foundation. Really, you guys are great. Thanks so much, and we'll see you guys next week. Goodbye, folks. Bye-bye.